Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support our channel, please subscribe. Breaking into the tomb of Anne Boleyn. The most notorious and infamous of Henry VIII's six wives was Anne Boleyn, the Tudor king's second wife. Their marriage would plunge England into a period of turmoil, in which England broke from Rome and turned their back on the Pope, and Henry became the supreme head of the Church of England. Those who could not support this often were persecuted, and many were executed, including some of Henry VIII's closest friends and advisers, such as Sir Thomas More and Bishop John Fisher. But despite all of this, Anne Boleyn would only be the Queen of England for a period of time just short of three years. She would spectacularly fall from grace, as Thomas Cromwell, the King's chief advisor, would plan her downfall, and Anne was accused of incest, adultery and treason. She was executed by a French swordsman inside of the Tower of London, and was then buried inside of the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, near to the execution site. But in the 19th century, 300 years after her execution, the grave of Anne Boleyn and her tomb was broken into. But what is the story of this? On the 19th of May, 1536, Anne Boleyn made her way from the apartments inside of the Tower of London to the scaffold, which was next to the White Tower, near to Tower Green. Many claimed she was hysterical in the tower after being sentenced to death, but in her final moments she showed poise and calmness despite her fate. She made a short speech to the crowd stating, Good Christian people, I am come hither to die, for according to the law, and by the law, I am judged to die, and therefore I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak anything of that, whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king, and send him long to reign over you, for a gentler nor a more merciful prince was there never. And to me he was every good, a gentle and sovereign lord, and if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus I take my leave of the world and of you all, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. O Lord, have mercy on me, to God I commend my soul. But then the French swordsman distracted her as she knelt on the scaffold, and from the distraction she did not expect him to swing his weapon, and her head was then taken clean off in one swift stroke. But following her execution, her weeping ladies, who remained with her until the end, collected the former queen's remains and tucked them into an old oak chest, which used to contain arrow staves. With this, they carried it to the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, and then her remains were buried in an unmarked grave. But this would not be the end of the story of Anne Boleyn's remains. In 1848, a historian visited the chapel, where Anne was buried, and he was not happy with what he saw, and he stated, I cannot refrain from expressing my disgust at the barbarous stupidity which has transformed this interesting little church into the likeness of a meeting house in a manufacturing town. In truth, there is no sadder spot on earth than this little cemetery. The chapel had fallen into disrepute, and the constable of the tower, who was appointed in 1876, agreed that urgent work needed to be done on the chapel, and he petitioned the Queen to approve this work. He wanted to make sure that the church was safe to use as a place of worship for those who lived and worked at the tower. One of the biggest problems with the chapel was the floor as it was sinking. It was said by someone doing the work on the chapel that, on removing the stones of the pavement, it was found, as reference to the burial register, to abundantly proved, that the resting places of those who had been buried within the walls of the chapel during the troublous times of the 16th and 17th centuries had been repeatedly, and it was feared almost universally, desecrated. When the tower ceased to be a residence of the sovereign or a state prison, the chapel of St Peter appears to have gradually come to be regarded too much in the light of a mere ordinary parish church, in which the interment not only of those who had lived in the tower, but even the residents in the neighbourhood were freely permitted. It is true that the bodies of those who had perished on the scaffold or died as prisoners within the walls of the tower were buried, no doubt intentionally, in great obscurity, but even if some memorial stone had recorded their burial place, it is doubtful whether they would have protected their remains, for in the instance of three Scotch lords, Lovett, Balmerino and Kilmarnock, 
although their graves were specially marked by a stone, which is still preserved, it was found that their bones had been much disturbed, so much so indeed as to be beyond all possible means of identification. It is even feared that in some instances coffins had been designedly broken up and their contents scattered in order to make room for some fresh occupants of the ground. But during the work on the chapel's floor, the builders exhumed many bodies and remains, and they believed that they stumbled across the remains of Anne Boleyn. Archaeologists exhumed the remains, and they noticed a number of physical characteristics of one of the skeletons, including the fact it had been beheaded. Dr Frederick Mowat, the Professor of Medicine to Queen Victoria, was brought in to help examine and identify the remains. The slabs where Anne was laid to rest were lifted, and at a depth of two feet the remains of her were found. Dr Mowat stated that they belonged to a female of between 25 and 30 years of age, of a delicate frame of body and who had been of slender and perfect proportions. The forehead and lower jaw were small and especially well formed. The vertebrae were particularly small, especially one joint, the atlas, which was that next to the skull, bearing witness to the Queen's little neck. He then stated... The bones found are certainly those of a female in the prime of life, all perfectly consolidated and symmetrical, and belong to the same person. The bones of the head indicate a well-formed round skull with an intellectual forehead, straight orbital ridge, large eyes, oval face, and a rather square full chin. The remains of the vertebrae and the bones of the lower limbs indicate a well-formed woman of middle height with a short and slender neck. The ribs show depth and roundness of chest. The hands and feet bones indicate delicate and well-shaped hands and feet, with tapering fingers and a narrow foot. He came to the conclusion that this woman in life would have been between five foot tall and five foot three, and he confirmed that the head was severed from the body. He noticed the small neck that Anne Boleyn was believed to have had, and with this he concluded without doubt that these remains were definitely the second wife of Henry VIII. The remains of Anne were then gathered up and sorted along with the remains of other prominent people buried inside the chapel nearby. They were then taken and stored inside of the Queen's house in labelled lead boxes and containers. Five months later, on the 13th of April at midday, seven men, including the chaplain of the chapel, gathered again for the reinterment of Anne Boleyn. The bodies that were discovered had been placed in special caskets, fastened down with copper screws with engravings on them. The men watched as the boxes were then reburied four inches below the surface, and a careful note was made of the positions of the burials. On top of where Anne was buried, a marble decorative tiled floor marks the place where she was buried. She was interred below the communion table, second in from the left, and the first full row of burials. She was buried between her brother George Boleyn and Edward Seymour, the Duke of Somerset. Those men who were doing the building work inside of the chapel stumbled across the body of Anne Boleyn, and the Doctor of Queen Victoria was certain that it was Anne Boleyn. No DNA was available to be tested, of course, but it's accepted that it was her remains that were then buried at the heart of the chapel with some form of dignity. Anne Boleyn is considered today the victim of Cromwell and Henry VIII's brutal personalities and the fact Henry just wanted rid of her. But to do this, he had ordered his friends to create a huge web of deceit and lies against her, and sadly she made her way to the executioner's scaffold. In death she was not taken far away, and was buried close by. There are some other rumours that Anne was buried elsewhere, or that her heart was buried in Norfolk or Suffolk, at a place of great importance to her. But today, the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula is a serene resting place for the second wife of Henry VIII. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.